Hi, I'm Chris. I'm Carl. And we're with 317 Games. We're here today to show you how to play the standard version of Quest of Shadowgate. Earlier, we showed you how to play the base version of the game. And if you haven't had a chance to check out that video, we highly suggest you go back and watch that as it will explain some of the core concepts of the game. And without further ado, I think we'll get into what's different about this version and the standard version. All right. When last we met, we covered the base game setup and rules, which hopefully you are well acquainted with, as this will help you understand the core concepts we may or may not hit on in this tutorial. And now we are going into the setup and rules of the standard gameplay. In addition to the basic game setup, you'll need to set out the Staff of Ages quest card near the quest deck. The Staff of Ages quest will always be out and cannot be discarded. One of the major differences about the standard game versus the base game is that, yes, the first player up to 25 victory points initiates the last round of the game, but if you can complete the Staff of Ages quest, you automatically win the game, which is no small feat. We will talk about the Staff of Ages quest shortly. Let's go over some setup and game changes first. When it comes to deciding who will go first, each player will draw an adventure card. Each adventure card has a torch value in the bottom right corner of the card. Did you even notice a torch value before? The player with the highest torch value will go first. If there's a tie for highest, each player will draw a new adventure card until the highest is revealed. Turns move clockwise from the starting player. Starting with the starting player, they get to choose the character card they want to play with. It can be a character on either side of the character card. Once all players have chosen character cards, then each player will choose an ability card. These are two-sided as well. One side does have the yellow star on the bottom left corner, which is suggested ability to use if you are just starting to play the, for the first time. The ability cards are chosen in reverse order, starting with the last player going counterclockwise to the starting player. Ability cards can be used once per turn and are not considered actions. There is one other addition to setting up the game, and that's the inclusion of pool cards. At the start of the game, lay out two cards from the top of the adventure card deck. Lay them just under the adventure card deck face up. When it comes time to draw cards, you can take one or both of the pool cards and or draw from the adventure card draw deck. Winning the game is a bit different from the base game. As we discussed earlier, there is an additional way to win the game instantly, and that is completing the Staff of Ages quest. The Staff of Ages is no mystery to those familiar with the Shadowgate lore, but to those unknowing, the Staff of Ages is the most powerful weapon in the story, used to defeat the Warlock Lord time and again. To complete the quest, the following conditions must be met. One. The player completing the quest must meet the Staff of Ages quest cost, which is 4 physical, 4 general, and 4 mental. 2. The player completing the quest must have in their acquired items the orb, the stave, and the thorn relic items in play. Number 3. There must be at least one acquired item of each type in play amongst all players combined, which means the player completing the quest doesn't need to have one of each item, but combined among all players there must be at least one of each in play. If the player completing the quest meets all the requirements, the game immediately ends in victory. The other way to win is to have the most victory points at the end of the game, and this is now calculated a little differently from the base game. Here's how. The player who hits 25 victory points initiates the final round of the game, just like in the base game. Each player finishes out their last turn leading back to the player that initiated the last round. To better understand how victory points are now calculated, there is a new game mechanic that has been featured called the first of type items. The first of type item are pretty much what it sounds like. It's the first item of its type to be played in the game. If you acquire the first of type item during your turn, turn it sideways to indicate that it is the first of its type item. Then take a black gem token and place it on the corresponding symbol on the Staff of Ages quest card. The black gem tokens are used to keep track of which item types are currently in play. All items must be in play before you can complete the Staff of Ages quest. If you decide to use a first of type item to complete a quest and it's discarded from play, the next player clockwise who has an acquired item of the same type turns their corresponding adventure card sideways and it becomes the new first of type item. If there are no other items of that type in play, then remove the black token from the corresponding symbol on the Staff of Ages quest card. The next item of that type to be acquired will become the new first of type item for its type. That being said, Victory points you earn by defeating quests is added to the item victory points you have acquired by the following criteria. Plus two victory points for each first of type item you have. Plus six victory points for having the most first of type items. Negative five points if you have no first of type items. Plus two victory points for each staff piece you have in play, which could be the orb, the stave, or the thorn. 
and negative 5 victory points if you have no staff pieces in play. Game turns have also been changed in the standard game, as it adds two more phases to a player's turn. The new turns play out in the following phases. The event phase, the torch phase, the action phase, the draw phase, and the end phase. The added event phase allows players to play an event card they have in their hand. This is not considered an action. The event card is an adventure card with the lightning symbol in the upper right corner. Again, this is played at the beginning of your turn. If you play an event card for its ability during the event phase, you may take a card from the top of the adventure card deck or pool card to replace the event card you just played. Event cards can only be played as either for its resources or for its ability, but cannot be played for both. The text on an event card takes effect as soon as it is played, and it will stay in play until either it becomes one full round, returning to the player that played it, or until another player plays an event card in which the first event card will be discarded. Only one event card can be in play at a time. When you play an event card, it's recommended that you put a gem token belonging to a player that played the event card to indicate who played the card, so when it comes back to that player, the event card is discarded. After the event phase comes the torch phase. Each turn you must choose one adventure card from your hand and play it as your torch. An adventure card's torch value is on the bottom right corner next to the image of the torch. This will vary from 1 to 5. In the base game, each player had 5 actions they could play during their turn, but in the standard game, the number of actions you can play is dictated by the number value of the torch card you play. No actions can be taken until your torch is played. Playing your torch does not cost an action. You may only play one torch per turn, and once an adventure card has been played as a torch, it cannot be used for anything else. Your torch remains in front of you until the end of your turn, and then it is discarded to the adventure card discard pile. During your action phase, one action has been modified. An action can be one of the following. Play an adventure card as a resource. Play an adventure card as an acquired item. Choose a quest to complete or cycle the quest cards and the pool cards. Cycling the quest cards also cycles the pool cards by discarding them to the adventure card discard pile and drawing two new ones to replace them. The draw phase plays out the same way as the base game, but during the discard portion, you'll discard the torch card at this time. Remember, your minimum hand size is three and the maximum hand size is six by the time it reaches the end phase. During the end phase, you'll replace any missing quest cards from the column and replace any missing pool cards. If there is an event in play, it passes to the next player in sequence. A new addition to competitive play is being able to steal acquired items of other players. Instead of playing an adventure card from your hand as an item, you may use an action to select an opponent's item to acquire. You may not select an opponent's item with one of his or her base types. You may not select an opponent's item if you already have an item of the same type in play. As soon as the item is selected, your opponent must choose one of his or her stats to double and announce it out loud. Then his or her increased stats are added to the item's cost. Your opponent cannot change which stat they are doubling after it's been announced. You can acquire the item by using resources and your stats to pay the item's increased cost. Let's walk through an example of stealing an item. Let's say I wanted to steal the signet ring from Carl. Carl's character is the Fendling Shaman Willemir, and his stats are 0 Physical, 2 General, and 2 Mental. My first action is to select the Signet Ring item. Carl then looks at his character stats and chooses 1 to double. Let's say he announces that he's going to double his Mental stat to 4. Now his stats are 0 Physical, 2 General, and 4 Mental. We add the cost of the Signet Ring to Carl's stats, which brings the sum total to 3 Physical, 4 General, and 6 Mental. My character card is Akira Tin, the Human Archer, and my stats are 1 Physical, 2 General, and 1 Mental, which leaves me minus 2 Physical, minus 2 General, and minus 5 Mental deficient of acquiring the Signet Ring card. If I play the Wild Card Circle Rune, this meets the required Physical and General cost, but in order to meet the Mental cost, I'll need to play the Event card Magnus's Bounty and the Relic King's Crown as resource cards to boost the mental stats of my character card, which meet and in some ways exceed the total needed to steal the signet ring from Carl. Sorry, Carl. Note, when playing the relic card King's Crown as a resource, it required no action to play. Always be looking out for that text on any given adventure card to help accomplish your tasks in the allotted action turns dictated by your torch card. For those who want to see how the game is played, both the base and the standard versions, we'll show you some gameplay between Carl and I. Stay tuned. And that's how you play Quest of Shadowgate. 
And if at any time you get stuck, the game does come with four summary cards that explain different rules of the game. For instance, like the actions, what happens during your turn, the item types, and how to score victory points. And that should help you get through the rest of the game. All right, that sounds good. Let's play. Sure, why not? It's a sad thing that your tutorial has ended here. 